I think one of the challenges, too, and I think one of the things that probably makes a lot of politicians afraid to do this, and even people in the media, is that if people like you or I ask these tough questions about how we assess our country's foreign policy, how we assess you know, what the negative consequences have been or are of the decisions that our leaders are making. We're very quickly labeled as being traitors or treasonous or anti-American. Don't you love this country? When in reality, yes, I love this country. I still serve in the Army Reserves almost 20 years. I am proud to wear this country's uniform. I will go and put my life on the line with my brothers and sisters in uniform to defend our security and freedom from those who seek to do us harm. And that's why I'm asking these questions. That's why I'm challenging this foreign policy establishment, because I recognize what's at stake. And I recognize that in order for us to be truly prosperous and free as a people and as a country, truly prosperous and free, we must be at peace. And that's where James, the, the quote from James Madison, I know you're familiar with it, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he talks about how the greatest threat to liberty or the, the threat that is most dreaded to liberty is war. But this, isn't, so, this is something they don't want us to think about. And I like Ben Franklin. There never was a bad peace or a good war. Right. Uh, so just to pick up on a couple of the comments you made, uh, you're absolutely right that raising any fundamental questions about the assumptions that underlie our foreign policy and our approach to the world stigmatizes you in Washington. And it's actually literally true for the people that work in Washington, like if you're a reporter who's on uh, some kind of crazy idea that contradicts the official narrative. People won't return your phone calls. Yeah. You'll be thought of as a kind of a nut. You'll never have lunch in this town again. Uh, so there's a tremendous pressure on people in Washington. And I see this. Young people coming into the foreign policy world in Washington are terrified, for example, about every tweet they write. Because yeah. 20 years from now, when they might be under consideration to be the co-vice deputy assistant something, uh, they're going to pull this out. So they're so yeah. afraid of making a single peep that's outside the narrative. And the other point about this civilian foreign policy establishment in Washington is that when you spend a little time understanding how that system operates, you realize that somewhat counterintuitively, the real warmongers in Washington do not wear uniforms. That's there right. is no greater warmonger in Washington than a civilian foreign policy official. That's These right. people have been completely formed by a certain culture where you go to certain schools, certain graduate programs, you get certain ideas, then you work in for certain congressional staffs, you work in think tanks, pretty soon you're totally vetted, and then you can come up and just to produce the same kind of uh, foreign policy that we've had all along. Uh, it's very difficult to break away from that, and uh, I guess you're an example of uh, how difficult it is for you once you step outside that consensus. You, you, you definitely uh, you get, you get, a, you get a hardened shell of armor around you uh, given, given the kinds of attacks that people, uh, people levy against those of us who are speaking the truth and, and challenging uh, their narrative, challenging the reality that this foreign policy establishment that's been in charge for so long has done a great disservice to this country has done a great disservice to uh, our security, has done a great disservice to our economy and the well-being of the American people. What to speak of truly dishonoring uh, those who raise their right hand, enlisting in our nation's military to support and defend the Constitution and to provide that security and freedom to the American people only to be so misused and abused by these civilian leaders and pol both politicians and those who have not been elected uh, because they care more about beating their chest or they care more about the military industrial complex or their own selfish ambition, not ultimately, not caring about the lives and the suffering, the lives lost and the suffering and the destruction that they cause both here at home and in other countries.